back. I had lunch with, with a group of friends from the Indian Institute of Technology where I graduated. And, and there was lots of beer. And, and the conversation turned to the nature of miracles and what they mean and what they don't mean. And in talking to my friends, all of them graduates in engineering, I realized that they don't really know as much about the nature of science and technology as they ought to. Most of them, after graduating from the Indian Institute of Technology, did other things. Our first speaker today graduated in metallurgy from the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay. He just told me before, uh, before the talks. And look what he's doing now. So this provoked me into talking to you today about the nature of science and technology, about the nature of the world that I live in. And I thought this might be interesting for you. It may be interesting and helpful to understand what goes on. So what then is science? Science is relatively recent. The word scientist is relatively recent, coined in the 19th century. But unlike Anil, who looked into the future, I'm going to look into the past and what the past means for the future. So when does science begin? You can take your choice. Science could have begun in Mesopotamia with, with astronomy or the discovery of the wheel or the Indus Valley civilization. Or, or the natural philosophy and the beginning of deductive reasoning that came with Plato. Whatever choice you make, at its very best, uh, controls are not working, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I probably pressed the wrong button. At its most exalted, there's an intimate connection between magic, science, and religion. All of these look at our entire conception of ourselves and our place in the universe. And all of us here, you and me, practice each of these things to different degrees, depending upon our bend of mind, depending upon our pro profession. How do you think science works? All of you know that it's the principle of deductive reasoning that, that works, that, that governs the way we work. But in a classical view, this deductive reasoning can be expressed as politician one, two, three are corrupt, and so all politicians are corrupt. And there is obviously a problem with this kind of reasoning. So Karl Popper explained how science ought to work. And this is a very rigorous definition of the way we ought to work. So there are a number of competing theories, and they're systematically subjected to the most rigorous attempts at refutation. And theories that better survive the process are more fit and not necessarily more true, and not necessarily protected from refutation in the future. There are no absolute truths in science. And so we have a self-regulating community. Remarkably, and quite remarkably, it's governed by a common ethos, an ethos of sharing of information, at least in academia, a skepticism about results, a strong belief in the pursuit of truth, and peer scrutiny. How do individual scientists work? What is the process of discovery? If you ask Sir Isaac Newton, probably one of the greatest scientists of our times, he said, I always think about this, my discoveries. I keep the subject constantly before me and wait until the first dawnings open little by little into full light. Not very different from what we understand of the process of meditation. Newton, by the way, believed in alchemy and practiced alchemy. And so Keynes, the economist describing Newton, said that his was, he was not the first of the age of reason, but he was the last of the magicians. How does science actually work? We've talked a little bit about how science ought to work. Scientists, believe it or not, are people. And as people, we are affected by the world around us, by all of you, 
we interact with the society around us. And Thomas Kuhn, who studied the evolution of science and wrote a beautiful book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, explains that there is always a dynamic between ideas that are shaped by an environment and ideas that challenge our environment. And there are then these two extremes, do facts with the conclusion, do conclusions uh, uh, force the facts. And Karl Max Planck, one of the greatest scientists of our times, said this, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing of the opponents, but ideas sometimes emerge after the opponents of those ideas have just passed away or gone away. So in science, as in everything else, self-interest matters, social values matter, sources of funding matter. Let's look at this process of way scientific thought has evolved over the centuries in, in matters that really affect our understanding of the universe as it, as it is. In 200 AD, Ptolemy's universe was a universe in which the Earth was the center of the universe. And there was plenty of space outside his universe for heaven and hell. Today, our understanding of the universe is very different. Our Earth is not the center of the universe. It's, 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 it is in a galaxy containing hundreds and thousands and millions of stars. Our galaxy is only one of several thousand millions that can be seen using modern telescopes. We have come a long way since Aristotle and Ptolemy. And what of the nature of this universe? Sir Isaac Newton in the 1600s described how bodies moved in space and time and the forces between these bodies and the mathematics needed to analyze those motions. And just about everything that, that you, the chair you're sitting on, the plane you fly on and so on is designed according to the concepts and the mathematics of Sir Isaac Newton. But in his universe, time and space are distinct entities and the universe has existed forever in a static situation. Einstein turned all of this on his head. He pointed out some flaws in Newton's thinking of the universe. He pointed out that in bodies which move relative to each other, the laws of science change. And that cannot happen. The laws of science must be absolute. And so he said, no, the speed of light is our absolute. And then in his universe, space and time are not. They're inextricably linked so that you can't think of space without thinking of time. And as you approach speeds of light and, and come to bodies with very high mass or energy, space and time itself can warp and change in strange ways. What are the consequences of all this for our understanding of the universe? Penrose and Hawking, using Einstein's theory of relativity, now showed that instead of an infinite static universe, the universe must have a beginning about 13.7 million years ago, maybe an end, but recently we understand that there is an expanding universe. But Einstein's relativity made up, met up with quantum mechanics. So in the mid-20s, there was this explosion of physics, and, and quantum mechanics came into existence. And what quantum mechanics does is to remove the deterministic nature of science. It tells you that for very tiny particles, like an atom, you can no longer measure, measure positions and the speed with any degree of certainty. If you measure position with certainty, you can't measure speed. If you measure speed with certainty, you can't measure position. And then Einstein's equations cannot predict what happens at the beginning of time, at the very beginning of time. And so we don't really understand how that universe was created how the Big Bang occurred. Einstein was uncomfortable with quantum mechanics. He said, God does not play dice. But he could not find a solution. And today, we still don't have a theory of everything where quantum gravity is combined with Einstein's relativity. And we've talked about the inanimate universe, but what of life? Man, like Earth, was considered to be the center of the universe. But our views of life have also changed. With Darwin's evolution, we now understand that we are part of an infinite set of forms of life 
and which are connected to each other completely and inextricably. The first single-celled organism began 4,500 million years ago. Remember, your universe is 14 billion years old. The first human being came into 60,000 years ago. And if this was Darwin's view of evolution, it is also true of the genetic view of evolution. Look at this picture of how an embryo changes with time. The messenger gene uh, sets up a concentration gradient of proteins. Different proteins are, ex uh, are expressed, as you see on the left-hand side of the figure. And each of these functions of the proteins then leads to that external embryonic form. This process happens in human beings. It happens in flies. It happens in rats. And the similarities of the genes of a mouse and human being range from between 70 to 80 percent. Certainly, we are not very different, you and I. You and I are not very different from the ant on the floor. I love that title, I am a dog. But all of us, most of the time, and most of us all of the time, can't really be bothered about when the universe began our relationship to the world around us. These time frames are too large to grasp. These relationships are too abstruse. This is where technology comes in. What is technology? Technology, of course, began as a craft. And here's a beautiful example of that craft. The casting of these Chola bronzes, this idol of Nataraja, and a description of that process, Madhuchistha Vignanam, the mind will as faithfully take the form of the object as copper occupying the mold. Philosophy expressed in terms of technology, technology expressed in terms of philosophy. And we practiced at the laboratory I worked in several years back, the most modern form of this technology, an identical technology but now used to make parts for an aircraft engine, military engines. The technologists now uses the same form of technology but builds upon a background of applied mathematics, science, and engineering to produce practical, workable results. There is an intimate relationship between science, technology, and war. Much of the technologies today, including some of the technologies Anil talked about, was driven by the need for dominance. Much of these technologies originated in battlefield necessities. The Einstein formula arose from his understanding of relativity, relativity, the connection between mass and the energy content of, this, of a body. And this relationship between energy and mass is used in every form of energy conversion, whether peaceful, the light over there, or whether extraordinarily destructive. So there is an ethics and a morality and, and a perception of this can be very anomalous and confused. Technology has taken strange shapes and strange actions. Here is a set of publications from Nature, which is one of the premier metallurg uh, scientific journals of our time, published in February 2012, describing a series of experiments not in Hitler's Germany, but in the United States, a, a country at the forefront of science and technology. So the infection of prisoners in Guatemala by American health authorities with STD, the non-treatment of hundreds of African-American men in Tuskegee and Alabama by the United States Health Service without treatment, though penicillin was available, to see how the disease progressed. All of it to understand the action of mustard and mama. So this, is, this also happens sometimes. This, 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 uh, this way that science and technology moves. And so there's an intimate relationship between technology, society, and the economy. Technology is indeed at the very heart of historical change in combining with the demand of goods, capital, labor, land, infrastructure, and the owner of the means of production of service. You can look at that through an example of the Industrial Revolution. Six pinners were needed to keep one weaver supplied with cloth at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. John Kay mechanized the weaving process. The productivity of the weaver now rendered the shortage of spinners critical. The spinners were happy 
the weavers were unhappy. And in 1764, James Hargreaves came up with the spinning machine. The spinners and weavers both lost their jobs, but productivity increased enormously. This is the nature of technology in society. It's a process which happens again and again and again, but all the time we, we see apparently a growth in our happiness or state of being. The evolution of information technology, and I don't want you to leave with the impression that technology springs up overnight. Anil talked about inf the information technology of the future. The information technology of the future derives from an understanding or the introduction of zero and mathematics by an Indian. The abacus, the Chinese abacus, concepts of Newman and Turing, the first computer, the microwave communication, and this is an abbreviated list of the various sciences and technologies that, that had to come together for information technology to be what it is today. And so there is a global relationship between research and development expenditure and the gross development product per capita. And this relationship expresses this interaction of technology with the various economic factors of society. And therefore, it's a matter of concern that we in our country have an expenditure in research and development which is of the order of 0.9% of our gross development product. A scientific population is way down there in terms of the number of, as, as a fraction of our population. In 2011, the United States government, the United States, public and private, spend 458 billion US dollars on research and development. India spent 3.1 billion US dollars, and that too at purchasing power parity. This is a matter of concern. And why is it a matter of concern? And I want to end by leaving you with some ideas about why all of you should get more engaged in the process of science and technology. We know now, and we know now from the talks of Anil, that the talk Anil gave just now, that technology has indeed become a fabric, an integral part of our society, and impacts society on a very large scale. But technology has, has impacts which we are not able to conceive very often. And so we have to make choices about which technologies will be used and how. And to make those choices, I want to tell you all that you can't leave those choices to decisions about those decisions about technology to technologists like Anil or scientists like me. Because you're looking at society as an integral whole. And we need to understand the effects of technology on every part of society to define the trajectory of, of technology. We have to understand the social utility of taxpayer-funded expenditure. We have to understand and the need to make decisions about the scale and direction of that money that we put in. What is the world that we want in the future? What are the issues that we want to address in our country, whether it's energy, water resources, health, the education of our peoples? We need to decide which technology we are going to use and how. And all of you need to be involved. I want to end here, but I want to tell you that if you're interested in some of these thoughts, I picked them up from, from these books that I had opportunities to read over the years, and I hope you will enjoy reading them too. Thank you very much.